Hello, everybody. I'm Nicolas Suzman, and we're back at Latin American Directions. And today we have the pleasure of having Vanessa Daza Castillo joining us for a very interesting discussion on abortion across the Americas. Vanessa is a Colombian lawyer and feminist activist. She's currently a fellow with International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific, and an activist at Siete Polas, a Colombian feminist activist collective she co founded. Vanessa, thank you very much and welcome to Latin American Directions. Hi, Nicholas, and thank you so much for this fabulous invitation. I'm thrilled to be here and talk a little bit about abortion and feminism and everything related. Thank you so much. So Vanessa, let's start mapping a bit the situation. Abortion has been a very current topic in the Americas with a very strong movement in Latin America. And this week we're seeing a very strong movement in the US with the leak of Roe versus Wade. Tell us a bit about this background, what's going on in Latin America and, and how's the situation at the moment? Well, Latin America is always, uh, or at least right now, especially, uh, you know, you have good news and bad news everywhere, right? Because I think one of the lessons we're getting from Robert V. Wade in the U.S. is that rights, liberties are never fully guaranteed and you have to be always on the guard to protect them, to protect your rights, to defend them. So in Latin America, we're having good news and bad news. And the good part is that lately we've, have, we've had a few better news or more good news than bad ones. And with this, I'm just talking about the cases of Argentina, Mexico, and Colombia, which have recently uh, partly decriminalized or legalized abortion. Uh, it was Argentina that started that in 2018, but then uh, it finally legalized abortion at the end of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and then Mexico did it last year, and then Colombia did it this year. So we've had three big wins, which I don't mean to, uh, I, I don't mean this wins to overshadow what's been happening in other countries where abortion has been further criminalized. Uh, we have countries such as Guatemala and El Salvador passing very, very restrictive laws. Uh, the same as the US. Uh, it started with Texas last year, passing this very restrictive uh, bill that restrictive, uh, restricted abortions uh, until the first six week of pregnancy other uh, states in the U.S. have followed that example, and now we have the potential almost imminent overturning of Roe v. Wade. So again, it's a very uh, mixed feelings sort of scenario with some countries leading the way forward with very, very important setbacks. Right, uh, and how can we explain this advances uh, throughout the region? Are they related? Are they unrelated? How, do, how do, does that go? They're absolutely related. And uh, coming from Colombia and being part of the Causa Justa movement, which was the movement that led the um, lawsuit that ended up in this landmark ruling by the Constitutional Court to criminalize an abortion until week 24, uh, we totally learned from and adapted and included and in the lessons we learned from Argentinian and Mexican, Canadian and Latin American activists in general. Um, and a very specific example of this is that until I think 2018, the discussion about abortion in Colombia was very concentrated in certain elites. And by elites, I mean feminist organizations, uh, lawyers, feminist lawyers, and the state. The conversation was not a wide public conversation at all. And that started to happen after what happened in Argentina. So in 2018, there was an, an attempt to legalize abortion through Congress. And the way the Argentinians just massified the conversation about abortion. So we got images and videos of the streets of Buenos Aires with flots and flots of women with green handkerchiefs. Um, and what happened there is what we saw is abortion became something of the public agenda. And not just the feminist and recognized longstanding activists, but everyone at the table was talking about abortion. Uh, from the youngest women on Instagram to, you know, the most renowned politicians and talk shows on the TV, everyone was talking about it. And that was something that, that was not something that happened just naturally or organically. That was the result of a realization that in order to make abortion happen or to legalize abortion, everyone 
or the topic had to be part of the public agenda and every, like, there had to be public awareness and public uh, receptivity of the issue in order to put more pressure on governments and Congress. And that engendered what we call the green wave, La Marea Verde in, in Spanish. And then inspired the entire movement in Latin America. So after we saw that and we saw the Maria Verde, we even adopt, adopted the green handkerchief. So we use that in Colombia as well. And I think all over Latin America, we've been using that, which started as a symbol in Argentina, but then it, it pretty much diffused all over the Latin American region. And we basically copied that in Colombia. So after 2018, um, you know, we, we took the conversation about abortion to social media. Many, many feminist collectives were born and they tackled the issue directly um, to the point that we've ourselves had very massive women protests in front of the court for International Women's Day with very, very loud demands for protection of self sexual and reproductive rights. Um, and I think this happens in the same way in Mexico and it's been happening all over Latin America. We're, we've seen the feminist movement being strengthened by different, uh, by, by women and members from you know, different ages, different disciplines, you know, from social media activists, social media personalities, influencers, to politicians, just, you know, scientists and doctors and experts, everyone is welcome to, it has, has to be part of the movement. Um, so it, it's, it's entirely connected. I feel like the advances in one country necessarily have an impact on other countries and neighbors. Uh, both the the setbacks as well and and the advances, everything I think has a has an impact on neighbors in Latin America and the Americas generally. Right, right. And Vanessa, why now? Why now? And and something that catches my attention is that during the last I don't know four or five years, we've seen uh, a turn to more conservative politics across our region, left or right, but conservative. And in the midst of this trend to the conservative specter of, of politics, we're seeing a lot of these advances. So my question is, why now? That is a great question. It's very paradoxical. I believe that what happened in Colombia, and I would say that it's something that also happened in other regions where we've seen some progress on abortion, is that we realized that we were just there to react, right? So since 2016, I would say, um, when you know, very, very conservative government rise uh, in the US, very conservative uh, right-wing movements, sorry, governments in Europe as well, in Asia, all over the world. And I think that that just empowered a lot of anti-right move, uh, movements and groups to you know, push for the elimination of a lot of rights, including abortion, but not limited to abortion. You know, having these governments in place just empowered them. And then we were there just to react. So that's what happened in 2018 for us, for example. We, were, we, we had to organize protests and strikes three times because three times anti-rights activists uh, sued or presented or filed lawsuits before the constitutional court or filed lawsuits to strike down regulations and laws. You know, they were the ones leading the battle. You know, they were the ones filing the lawsuits. And we were just there to react. We were just there to, you know, protest and go to the court in response to that. Um, we were all just very, very reactive. And that's when we realized two things happened there. It's a mixture of law and politics, which I adore as well. Uh, we saw that our constitutional court in Colombia was rejecting and rejecting and rejecting all of their attempts. So we knew we, were, we gained this awareness of the importance and the significance of our court in our country. That's what showed us, okay, we have a court that is welcome, that welcomes women's rights and women's bodily autonomy. Why aren't we harnessing that? Why is it that we're just reacting and not being more proactive? in the defense of our rights. And that's when we said, we, there's a very uh, fertile scenario here amid a wave of conservative um, governments. We ourselves, we have a progressive court. That's our battlefield, that has to be our battlefield. And that's when we decided to file our own lawsuit. 
we were not going to react anymore. And I think that a very similar, you know, analysis can be made about Argentina. You know, they knew their battlefield was not the court, but the Congress. And I feel like the feminist movement has to have just been realizing that we still have institutions that could that can be our, our battlefields and we can use them. So instead of just responding to whatever attempt anti-rights -right movements made, we decided to be proactive ourselves. And I think that's the, the result is precisely, um, you know, progressive rulings from courts and progressive laws from Congresses. Right, right. That, that's very interesting. And I think it fits rightly in the discussion they're having at the U.S. right now. And it's, okay, we know that the court is probably striking down Roe v. Wade, right? Let's go to Congress, right? Yeah. But that Congress is not helping either. So what do we do and what are the pros and cons of going through Congress or through the courts, not only the states, of course, I understand this is a country by country discussion, uh, but overall, what are the advantages of going through one of the two ways? Um, I, I believe that right now, uh, especially in the U.S., and I'm not an expert in U.S. politics or law, but uh, our analysis now is that um, there has to be, first of all, a strengthening of the feminist movement itself in the U.S., which has been, uh, I, I, I believe the word is, it's, 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 it's just diffused a lot. And this is something we've been seeing uh, even before Trump got into power, and it's how right after Roe v. Wade, anti-rights movements organized themselves. And the, the result is what is happening now, whereas progressive movements and feminist activists um, and the Democratic Party itself, you know, they just, they just stay, stay still, uh, so to speak, right? Instead of taking the active decision of defending and constantly protecting the rights and further or expand the protections, uh, you know, we have a we, we see President Barack Obama saying that you know abortion is basically something that's too controversial. There's already Roe v. Wade. There's no need to pass or to prioritize any laws on abortion because that's basically you know there already. It's gained. It's 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 a win. It's there. It's a victory, right? Um, so I believe the first thing we have to do, and, in the, and one of the main lessons from all those processes is that we cannot just stay still anymore or ever. Um, once we have a ruling from a court, we have to go to court. That's what we have to do. We have a ruling from the court, but that's not the end of it. We ourselves have to go to the Congress. We have to go to regulatory authorities. We have to go to the health ministry. We have to go to the people. We're talking about social decriminalization. Because it's not just on state institutions, it's also with the people, right? Social imaginary. Um, so I believe, you know, there's many setbacks or drawbacks of going through Congress, especially, you know, with the, with the political situation in the U.S. and seeing that the Democratic Party, which is the party that you would expect to put these things in the agenda, you know, it's it's not just divided, but the, you know, there's there's there seems to be a lot of hesitation on getting directly involved with the issue. Nobody wants to, nobody from this side or from the Democratic Party or the progressive side, or very few people want to engage directly with abortion rights, you know, speak about it explicitly and explicitly pass bills. It's just something that is happening right now because of the week of the decision. Um, but it's, it's been a conversation that's been constantly postponed. So it has to go to Congress for sure. It also has to go through state law. In, in, in state congresses. It has to go everywhere, but I would just insist as well in the social movement itself. You know, we can't, we can't just deposit everything. I mean, the state is necessary because it's the state that's gonna guarantee your right to health and, you know, and, and, and the infrastructure to be able to provide these services. Uh, but it's not just the state, we have to, you know, and, and one lesson that I think Latin Americans can give to the US is that, you don't do this without the public and the people and the movement and the strong movements and involving everybody in the in the cause. It's not just you know women or a specific feminists. We have to have everybody on the conversation. Um, so yeah, I mean we have to just permeate, I guess, every institution possible, especially now that the court is, or at least in the U.S., that the court is uh, has a majority of conservative justices. Right. 
And Vanessa, how do you engage with the public in countries such as ours, such as Latin American countries, which have a, I wouldn't say a majority perhaps, but have a very strong and very vocal conservative sector, right? How do you make, a, I don't know, it's, I would say a minority, but maybe an alternative claim, a conversation of all the people, and how do you gather sufficient support to create pressure on decision makers, right? So they feel safe to make this decision and they say this is the right choice to do at the moment without jeopardizing our legitimacy or authority and even our well-beings as individuals. Sure, that's a great question too. Our lesson, uh, you know, in Colombia, what we saw is, you know, you can't just, um, ex you, know, you have to make a few con concessions in terms of the arguments that you're going to use to convince people that abortion is necessary and it has to be protected. And there's two things that I that I would highlight um, that really have some power of bringing more people into the conversation and lowering the guard a little bit and, and being more receptive to um, you know to, to abortion itself. The first is that um, you know in our speech, what we said is what we we'll, what we're looking for uh, is that abortion you know, abortion should be regulated and abortion should definitely be a matter of, you know, law and regulation and control. It's just criminal law has nothing to do there. You know, let's just not send women to jail for doing this. Let's have, you know, let's look for alternatives. And then what we did is what we found out in many conversations we had with family members and, and friends, and we tested this is, you know, you many people that are against abortion still are not convinced about sending women to jail for that reason. So that would be our, our, I guess, our framing. It's like, you know, abortion has to be regulated and there has to be a conversation at the level of the state. Let's just not do this using, you know, jail or criminal, criminal law. It shouldn't be a matter of criminal law. And usually we would say, you know, most, most women either, I mean, a, a, huge proportion of women either have had an abortion before or know someone very close that has had one, would you be in favor of sending that person to jail? You know, your friend, your mother, your, your, your aunt, you know, someone that's close to you, you know, would, would, would you like that? And, and I guess what I want to say here is that when you take the conversation to a personal and empathetic level, then the tone changes and the attitude changes. And there's another very important issue that we highlighted a lot in Colombia, and I feel like it's also very present in the conversation in the U.S. and, and in, the, in, in Latin America generally, is the issue of inequality that traverses or that highlights or that cross-cuts abortion issues. And it's that, you know, women, middle class and high class women, rich women, white women, they're going to get their abortions, whether they say or claim they're in favor or against. The thing is, it's... It, if, if women of color, indigenous women, poor women, they're going to be the ones bearing the burden of, uh, of making abortion a crime. So we would bring the issue of inequality to the conversation and say, you, you know, this is not just, and, you know, this, this has a very clear group of women that are going to suffer and they're, they're already marginalized for many reasons. So we cannot just, you know, further or exacerbate those burdens anymore. Um, so I feel like that those two approaches were very useful for us. I guess that's also context dependent. Um, but in a country that's so conservative, we were able to make our way through, you know, conservative groups and conservative friends and families with these two, I guess, uh, tools. One talking about inequality and the injustice of the issue, and another one just talking about, you know, what the consequence should be and whether jail wasn't a very a harsh consequence for just a poor woman that's been raped trying to decide over their life. Right, right. That's 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 very interesting. Also, something else we've seen in the region is that even in the victories we have, abortion has been regulated in very different ways, right? My question for you is, which is the end game? Which is the objective? Are you fine with these decisions? Are you aiming for something else, what's the objective uh, of advocates uh, for the right to abortion? Yes, um, the end game and the end goal is definitely to eliminate or strike down entirely 
the crime of abortion. So for, for now in Colombia, what we have is uh, what we call a, a combination between a temporal and causal system. So we talk about two kinds of systems. The first is a temporal one, which is basically uh, limiting abortion or allowing abortions until a certain number of weeks. And then the other system is the, the, the causal system, which is basically identifying a few reasons or justifications under which you're able to get an abortion, no matter what stage your pregnancy, your pregnancy is in. Um, before this year, what we had in Colombia was the second system. So we had three reasons for which women could get abortions in any stage of their pregnancies. Um, and now we have a combination of the two. Uh, and the reason why they're not enough, and that's what we saw in Colombia, and it's, you know, again, something you can see all over Latin America is that whether you have a limit of time or a condition in terms of, you know, the justification for abortion, hospitals and uh, public uh, uh, social services servants and providers are going to find the way to use those requirements to not provide the service. So that's what we saw a lot in Colombia. Um, we saw women that got to hospitals looking for an abortion that were sent to three or four or five other hospitals because they were always saying, you know, this is not the place where you should go. You need to, we need, you know, you go to this other place that they will give you the service because of this, you know, the, your membership to the, to the public health, health system, you know, your income, many reasons. We had also the case of women that would ask for an abortion because of physical health issues and doctors wouldn't provide the service because they weren't uh, or they found that uh, the, the medical um, opinion of other doctors wasn't enough. So they would send women back, you know, and send them to look for other authorizations from other institutions or doctors that were qualified. We also saw the case of women that were looking for an abortion because they were raped and they weren't provided the service until the, the, the lawsuit was filed. And, and at times even, they would deny the service until the process had, gotten, had reached a certain stage in the criminal process. So every time you have a temporal limit or a conditional limit, um, there is a way for you know, the service to be denied to you. Um, so that's why it's not enough. So what we have now, it's great. It's a very progressive system. We have, you know, in Colombia, 24 weeks. In other countries, we have 12. You know, in other countries, there's no temporal limit at all. Um, but that's the thing. Limiting the right is always, you know, it's limiting the right. You know, in the end, you don't have full bodily autonomy. Um, so that's the end game. Now, it, it does, doesn't mean that we're right now looking for you know, that now that we have this ruling, we're already looking for the complete decriminalization because we understand that there's a process that has to go on. But that's the end game, at, you know, at, at last. Right. Uh, and Vane, just to get a bit of the inside story, tell us about Causa Justa, your experience. How was it? Like, from the outside, you see the ruling, right? You see the media campaign. You think that that was great. That was very interesting. That was admirable. But how is it from within? How did it came to be? Uh, yeah, just I just want to know your experience. Go beyond the movement and get into the person and know how it is. Oh, Causa Justa is just one of the best things that has happened to me in the last years. Because, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, group that we have of different women and feminists from different backgrounds and contexts and disciplines were presented there. You know, I am a lawyer and the reason I got into Causa Justa was not because I was a lawyer. It was basically because, you know, I was part of a digital media collective. We did all social media things, right? But we're working together with uh, women such as Ana Cristina Gonzalez or Florence Thomas, which are you know, renowned feminists have been working on this for years, for decades even. Um, and we see people from all over the country. Um, so we get in our meetings and we always have a lot of fun. Uh, there's always a lot of very interesting discussions. I don't mean to say that, you know, because we have a common goal, it's not difficult. It's, there, there, there are no disagreements. 
no, but we, in the end, we know we have an end goal uh, and we always find the way to go through or resolve our issues and differences to find a way forward. Um, so we work as any other, I guess, movement. We have a communications department, we have an incidents or strategy department, we have a group of lawyers, and we all communicate amongst each other. We use WhatsApp groups. Um, you know, we have uh, sessions where we just go to work, then we take some time off and just go for a beer after work. And, you know, we have a lot of fun, we party. Um, there was a huge party when the decision came out. Uh, it was amazing. Um, and yeah, it's just, again, just learning that because if you want, if you really want to achieve things, you have to invite many different people and audiences. Um, and that's exactly what we try to do. Right. And Vani, just as a final reflection, and uh, this is not only about abortion, we could say this about any human rights issue that relates to the individual, but what's the relationship between the right to abortion and the future of democracy? Oh, wow. I just feel that you cannot have a full democracy if a part of your population doesn't have the right to decide over their own bodies and life projects. And that's, that's the end of it. If you have, if you're imposing motherhood on women that don't want to be mothers, then you're not, you don't have free individuals who can take you know, free decisions and participate in social life and cultural life according to what they want to do and, and who they are. Uh, you're imposing certain standards and certain life standards to people and you don't have a democracy when that happens, right? So I, I do think that we, we, we just, you know, something we tend to say is like, we're second class women or second class people unless we have full autonomy over our bodies and our lives. And the way to do that is just legalize an abortion. If you want a democracy, a full, real democracy, just give women and, and give people the right to decide over their own bodies and take the choices they, they want for their lives. I think that's a wonderful way to close the today's episode, Vanessa. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Let's hope the fight ends one day. Uh, thank you so much. To our dear audience, we'll see each other in two weeks. This was Latin American Directions. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.